Susan, having you on for this book, Bittersweet, I really feel like I'm coming to the party late because you wrote quiet. And I totally missed that one. And it's, it's so my heart. So I just want to tell you that I, uh, on, I did the, the quiz, the quiet quiz, and I was uh, 17 true three false. So that tells you about me a little bit. Oh yeah. Wow. And isn't it a funny thing? How many podcasters are quiet types as they tell me and like, and it's also true, you know, on the lecture circuit, like if you go around at conferences speaking the way I do, and then you start chatting with your fellow speakers, they're all introverts. It is odd. It, it really surprises me with comedians, uh, yes. you know, even, even stand-up yes. comedians. You're an and- I mean, I just, I couldn't, I didn't really have a file for that when I first heard that. And I, and at that time I thought I was an extrovert as well uh-huh. um, in my own uh, unawareness. Well, which is what we're going to get into here with bittersweet uh as well and so i'll tell you on your bittersweet quiz so folks i'm saying that the quiet quiz so 17 true three false that labels me as quite the introvert um if you if you haven't taken that and you can do that at susan's uh, susankane.net you can do that on our website and find it and the bittersweet quiz which is showing your temperaments i was a 6.9 so you that. were on the bittersweet side of the i was on spectrum. the bittersweet side yeah. Yeah. And there's our, and there's our intro to the show because <laughs> I have lived my life primarily. So if we're talking about the Hippocratic temperaments, sanguine and choleric, the exact same as their, our great American culture, as you've yes. shown us, that's what runs it. That's performance that's out there getting the accolades. It's what got me on the podium as a professional athlete. And you get a lot of applause for that. And yet it's not really who I am at the core. And it feels like that's so much of your message. Here we are. And we have people of all different temperaments, but the one that gets the ones that get the applause are sanguine, optimistic, social, uh, and choleric, which it it sounds bad. Give us a better term because it says short tempered, irritable, and fire, but could you say driven to a degree? Um, yeah, I guess you could say driven and you, you, (laughs) but it is also about, um, choleric is about being willing to be you know, ag- aggressive to the point of confrontational and belligerent even, but uh, I guess what you could really say is if you look at the culture that we now have of righteous outrage to a degree that is getting us all in trouble, you know, where there's a kind of performative outrage that people engage in every day in their social media, that that's, that's kind of a, an outgrowth of us living in a culture that 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 really lionizes that on the one hand the cheerful and optimistic and on the other hand um you know the the assertive to the point of aggressive let's say which is interesting and again you know when we look at any of these yeah go ahead yeah sorry i was just gonna say i mean for all these temperaments like as with almost everything in life, it's like there's the good side of it and there's the bad side of it. And yes. you know, your your deepest weakness is also your deepest strength. Um, and your deepest strength is your deepest weakness when you flip it over. And so that's true of all of this. You know, it, like if you're tearful and optimistic, it's it's obvious what the strengths are of that. Um, and the downsides of it are that it can be delusional and it could look delusionally positive and it doesn't admit the full range of human experience. And and then if you look at the choleric, which means the assertive to the point of aggressive, well, it's very helpful as an individual and as a nation to be able to assert your boundaries. But if you do it too much, you know, then, then it leads to divisiveness. And so with bittersweetness, which is kind of the melancholic temperament that I'm talking about in this book, um, we're, we're very aware in our culture of what the downsides are of that. Um, it's it's not a celebrated way of being in our culture. Um, Mm -hmm. It it feels to us kind of like droopy and, and uh, not um, like not go-getting in some way, but the upsides of this temperament, and this is what I spend the book demonstrating is that it is connected to um, creativity and the expression of melancholy is also connected to human connection and human communion, and even to a sense of transcendence. Um, we, we found that people who score high on the bittersweet quiz also tend to score high on measures of creativity, measures of awe, measures of wonder, um, spirituality. So there's this, there, 
there's this kind of hidden superpower in the melancholic temperament that we're, we're not aware of because we we're kind of only aware of the negative side of the, of the temperament and not of its, not of its powers. Well, I, and I appreciate you talking about that, that there is a, a good and bad. I think people tend to look at even personality profiles and deem that this style is better than another. And we get into trouble doing that. And on that same parallel, in a sense, I am sensitive to the label of you are this, like we're all yeah. a thoroughbred in this sense, a thoroughbred temperament, a thoroughbred personality style, because take the choleric, you said the word go getter a minute ago, you know, go getter, a risk taker, assertive, aggressive. I I'm high on the aggressive and assertive aspect, uh, to a point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In some areas, I am some areas I'm, I'm not, but I'm amazingly conflict averse, which doesn't fit there at all. And so, you know, when I, as people are, are hearing us talk about that, I want them to hear that and realize, gosh, you're not stuck in a box of this thing mm -hmm. we're looking for. If we look at every one of them as a spectrum, I bet you could draw us a great graph of how the spectrums can overlap and overlay. Some of them are natural. Some of them are learned and, and whatnot. And so it is, it's a difficult, um, it's, it's complex, I guess you could say. Yeah. And I, I, I really love it that you're starting out by reminding us of that nuance. It's, it's incredibly important because humans are so incredibly and richly complicated. Yeah. Um, so no one is all one thing and no one's saying that anyone should be all one thing. Um, yeah. and we all, you know, if you think of Th this particular temperament structure that we're talking about now of like the, the, the sanguine cheerful and the assertive aggressive choleric and then the melancholic bittersweet. Um, I would wager that every human on earth has aspects of all three of those in them. Um, some of us are going to tend in one way more than another way for sure, but we all know them. Um, but but what's really, but what's helpful to understand is also kind of like the cultural analysis. So to be aware of ourselves as individuals who are living in a culture that is encouraging us to develop one side of ourselves in a kind of lopsided way and to shut down or ignore the other sides of ourselves. So, you know, like our culture is telling us, be cheerful, be optimistic, be assertive to the point of aggressive, don't be melancholic, don't be bittersweet. Um, and that is shutting ourselves off from the part of ourselves that has access to these states of, of creativity and connection. Um, and, and I don't think we want to shut them down. Well, that's what we're going to dig into. Is it fair, Susan, to say also that if someone views themselves as a hundred percent, you know, in this quadrant, in this temperament or personality style, whatnot, mm -hmm. That as you say that, yeah, we all have pieces. Let's look at the four temperaments here. And folks, you can go look up the Hippocratic temperaments. It's sanguine, melancholic, choleric, and phlegmatic. And if we look at that to say, or I feel like you just said, we all have parts of those in us. However, we may be very unaware of them. We may be performing, as you said, towards a certain uh, aspect of these. And we do feel like we are all one of it because we are not aware of, uh, ourselves. And, I, and I'm telling my own story because mm -hmm. I did, I live so much in that, as you said, sanguine and choleric, that was who I, that's the persona I embrace. That's the applause I embrace. That's the affirmation that I embrace. And I can do that just like I can extrovert. Now mm -hmm. it drains me but I yeah. can do that. And, um, uh, but you know, again, so we can do those things, but we're performing, they can drain us the natural us, which I don't know if we ever get to our full natural selves. There's the quest. Uh, mm -hmm. and you're saying we're going to have parts of these and that's what you have me looking at and considering. I was texting with my family yesterday, some of the things out of your book, literally taking snapshots, go look at the, this is, this is, this is me guys. And this is, I was naming some of my family. I think this is some of you guys. And I don't know that we've opened the door to allow and applaud for that. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So like, what were some of the things that you saw in bittersweet that you feel like describe you or describe your family members? Oh my gosh. I have marked your book up, Susan. Uh, I mean, yeah, I can, <laughs> I can show you, show you here, but the, just the aspect I'll, I'll tell you when I looked at melancholic, and you do talk about 
sadness. And I, and I want us to dig into uh, sadness, but I also in that you do say, you know, analytical is part of it, quiet, whatever, but I thought of thoughtfulness mm -hmm. and lately in lately, literally recent years, I have grown fond of the concept of contemplative. Yeah. I want to contemplate. I want to yes. consider things. And that to me is, uh, that's not what we applaud is, you know, the busyness, the I'm super busy. I'm, I'm thinking, no, I want margin in my life to that's when I can go deep. That's when I can create, but man, you don't get kudos for saying, no, I got plenty of time and I'm really flexible. That's not where your credibility comes from in our culture right now. I hope it, well, your books, I hope it helps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And it's a funny thing because we do obviously in our culture reward creativity. Like once it's successful creativity, then we, then we True. reward it. But sure. we don't reward the conditions that breed su successful creativity um, because successful creativity requires number solitude and it's often associated with states that have to do with longing and sorrow, you know, not, not perpetual sorrow, but being attuned to those aspects of human nature. Um, I mean, you saw this in the book that there are just so many studies showing this connection. Uh, between experiencing sorrow and then entering into the creative state where you're kind of turning the sorrow into something else, which I think is what creativity is often doing. So, you know, we, we love a good song and we love a good movie and we love a great artist, but we don't love the states that breed that person. Okay. Thank you for that. That, that opens up a door too, Susan, because I have been, as you have privileged to know, uh, being close friends with a lot of literal artists, you, you, mm -hmm. the performing arts, music, whatnot. And I've always been enamored with their story. You mm -hmm. know, somebody will come, Hey man, I got a new song that I wrote for somebody or wrote for myself or whatever. And, uh, and then they'll say, you know, let me play it for you. And it's just raw on the piano. And then I, they say, yeah, I was doing this and I was doing X and it came out. And then I got together with, you know, whoever co-writer and we did this and I get to hear the story. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I wish people could hear this. Cause all they hear is the produced thing out there and they take from it what they will, yeah. but you're right. We don't even, we don't, not only do we not really applaud, we really just don't go to there, go to the, the process that got this art to be delivered. Finally, we, we see what's delivered and we don't go and look at the, give gravity, maybe give value mm -hmm. to the process. They got it. And if anything, yeah, we may, we may uh, look at it negatively. And I think that's what you're showcasing that we tend to do and how really counterintuitive it is. Yeah. Yeah. And like the life experiences that give rise to it. Like, I mean, I, I happen to love the musician with a crazy love. I love the musician, uh, Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen. And, I know yeah, I've, I've so been I, listening to him. Thanks to you again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I dedicated the whole book to him. And, um, and as I was writing the book, I was like learning more about his story and his musical career began when he was nine years old and his father died and he, and his father had been, I think like, um, uh, he, he sold suits, you know, for a living. And, and so he took one of his father's old bow ties and he wrote a poem and he, he took the bow tie and he took the, the poem and it was the first poem he had ever written yeah. nine years old. And he buries it in the family backyard. And that's like his first act of creation and his, his first act of turning pain into something beautiful, which is what artists often do. And, um, and we actually know there's all these studies, there are studies showing that many of our great artists lost one or both parents before the age of 18, um, which is not to say God knows that one would wish that on anyone. And it's also not to say that if you were lucky enough not to be orphaned before age 18, that you can't do something creative. It, it's, it's just to kind of, it's just these studies are a kind of echo of something that's going on in human nature, um, where when we're functioning at our best selves, we have the capacity to take the difficult things that happen to us and turn them into something else. And, um, and that's not to say that we have to turn them into something conventionally creative, like a painting or a song, or, you know, that you have to suddenly host a rock concert or something. It's, it's, there's a lot of different ways to be creative and there's a lot of different ways to make meaning out of 
this curious situation that all humans are in, which is we are going to experience joy and love and beauty. And we're also going to experience pain and loss and sorrow. And that is just what it means to be alive. And the question is, what do you do with that? What do you do with that? I read your stat in the book on artists losing parents. And it reminded me of a similar study that was done of some of the world's greatest leaders a long time ago. But the, you know, the, the, the CEOs, politicians, some of our, our biggest uh, positions in the world at the time. And, and when it was done, it came back that 80% or so of those people had endured some significant hardships in their upbringing, specifically having lost a parent or a sibling or having a handicap or dealing with a, a, um, a sibling with a handicap. And in talking about it, we kind of surmised, we were thinking, you know, why is that? Why does that hardship lead to, because for every one person that that hardship, they took it and created something that drove them to do something great. There's a whole bunch of others mm -hmm. and it overcame them. Um, but why is it that some of them did take it as a strength and go forward? And what we really came down to is that they, for them, they're in their upbringing, they learned that the world wasn't all about them. There was mm -hmm. something bigger going on. And, but still back to that pain that they endured. Why do we have our most prolifically, I don't, I don't, I don't want to use the word success, but without a, a lack of better words, successful people. And they have come from some level of pain. It almost makes you think that the biggest detriment to your, you know, quote success is just kind of having a nice little vanilla life. Uh, can you, yeah. And I, 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 I wouldn't say that okay. because the, the way, the way I look at it, the way I look at life is that there are a lot of different kinds of powers that are on offer and that the mm. secret to a life well-lived or one of the secrets is to figure out the power which you've been granted and then to use it well. And so I think that somebody who is lucky to have lived at least up until this moment, you know, a relatively untroubled life. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe someone who has a very cheerful and optimistic temperament and all that, that person has one particular set of powers that they should go forth and use. And we know those powers well, and they can be quite wonderful. Um, and then the person who has had more than their fair share of adversity and who perhaps has a more melancholic temperament, that has a power of its own and they should use that one. And we know this message from all the, the movies, right? It's like, like, look at the Marvel movies. It's like, you know, one person has the power of amazing strength and another person can climb up walls like a spider, you know, and, and then you go to Star Wars and there's another person who's granted the, the power of a lightsaber and the force. That's kind of how it works. We, we all have our different powers. We don't get all of them but we get some of them and we have to use the ones we have. Um, yeah. And this particular set of powers that you were just talking about with that leadership study, like it made me think of Aristotle. I, I started the book quoting him, you know, it was yeah. 2000 years ago. He, he starts looking around and he asks the question, why is it that so many of our great poets, politicians, and philosophers seem to have such a melancholic temperament? Why is that? And that, that question has been echoed throughout the ages. Um, and, and my book is kind of an answer to that question. Well, so on that, one of the terms that comes out of melancholic that you discuss at length in the book is the word sad mm -hmm. and how we associate so much negative baggage out of that, that what I ended up pondering was why do we associate sadness with weakness? Can we not be sad and, and not only strong, but can we be sad and even optimistic? Can we be sad and, and, and have, you know, deep abiding joy as well, but we also have sadness. We don't seem to hold that together, be able to in our culture. I know. And it's a very strange thing because the, I mean, the whole premise of what bittersweet is, is the fact of joy and sorrow always traveling together. So it, it's not really ever the case that all is sadness, you know, sadness coexists with 
with happiness and joy as, as your question suggests. Um, and I think the real power of sadness that our culture is cut off from is the power of human connection. Yeah. That there's something about when we're willing to admit that we're sad and be attuned to other people's sadness, it opens us up to other people. Um, and I, I, I look in the, I look at this in the book from many different points of view, but one of them is the story of Pete Doctor, who's the great director at Pixar, um, who created Up and Monsters, Inc. And, and then the movie Inside Out. And Inside Out, which was this huge box, you know, box office sensation. Um, it's a movie that's basically looking at the emotional life of an 11 year old girl. And when he starts telling, when, when he started working on it, the movie is basically focusing on her emotions. So the emotions are the central characters. And he knew that he had to pick two emotions as the central character, because that's the only way to tell a story is, to, you know, to have your main characters. And, um, and at first he picks, he picked the emotions of joy and fear to be the main characters. And he worked on the movie for like three years. And then he suddenly realized this is, it's just not working. And the movie is going to be a flop, he thinks. And he starts spiraling out of control and he kind of descends into this pit of sadness because he's thinking the movie's going to be a flop. I'm going to lose my whole career. I'm, I'm not going to work at Pixar anymore. And then, he, and then what he thinks is I'm going to be cut off from the people who I love best. Like all these people at Pixar, my call my beloved colleagues, I'm not going to get to work with them anymore. I'm going to lose them. And that's when he has his big epiphany which is that what sadness does is it connects us to people and it makes us realize how much we love them. And so he decides that he has to put sadness at the center of the movie. And, and he has to go and tell the executive committee at, at Pixar that he's been working on this thing for three years and he's had it all wrong all this time. And he's worried that because they live in this same culture as the rest of us that is afraid of sadness, he's thinking they're not going to let him do it. Like who would want sadness as the main character of a children's movie, but somehow he convinces them and sadness is right at the center alongside joy. And the movie is a huge sensation because it, we, we watch the movie and we know it's telling us a deep truth. You can just feel it. And, and the truth is the relationship between sorrow and human connection. And it's the same truth that we feel when you listen to a sad song that you love at a, in a concert hall surrounded by other people who love the song. And the reason we all love it is because, because the song is speaking to a sorrow and to a pain that we've all shared. And we know we're like in it together. And this is the state of being human and we're not walking this state alone. Mm -hmm. And that's why at those concerts, you have some of the most profound moments of your life because the the experience of shared human connection is like, you know, transcends what, what you'd feel in, in the everyday. Well, Susan, I, I'm, you know, I'm reading the book, I'm resonating, I'm hearing you talk now, and I would be remiss if I did not also in candor uh, admit, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a therapist, well, I see therapists a lot, but I am now. And the latest book that was recommended to me, or not, not the latest, but a recent one was Brene Brown's uh, Atlas of the heart. Yeah. And I know you just, I think you were just on Brene Brown's show or she was on yours or, yeah, or one yeah. of them. and it was prescribed to me mm -hmm. because of my lack of awareness of my mm -hmm. own emotions. Mm -hmm. So even as I read your book and I'm resonating with it, and there are things that I have known about myself, but I, it's, it's an area of blindness uh, mm -hmm. for me to look back and go, gosh, that's why I was so moved by that. That's, that's why I was you know, 19 years old. And I remember the state I was in on what race we were going to when Bonnie Raitt's song came out, I, I can't know. make you love me. And I'm just near tears. And I'm one, I don't cry. And, and two, I'm, I don't really feel And three, I have no relation. I've never been in love or even in a relationship. And yet she just slayed me with that song and I'm listening wow. to it. And just, you know, those, those moments that we have. And yeah. I, it was such a comfort really to read bittersweet Susan, even the style that you wrote it and it helped 
confirm and I think bring to the surface all the visions and all the sounds and the things that have been, as you talk to in the melancholic aspect, it's a, a, a tendency to notice beauty, yeah. but along with it is pain. And there's been so much, I think some things that I've even shelved that have been so poignant is the word you use so much mm -hmm. poignant and beautiful that it's just, it's a pain. It's almost too much. Um, looking back, I, one of your questions in your quiz was, I think, are you moved by old pictures? Did I get yeah. that right? Something mm -hmm. to that degree? You did. You did. I, I really, I'm at a point right now. I've got, I've got a lot of kids. I've got older kids. I got younger kids and looking at the young pictures of my older kids is mm -hmm. almost too much for me right now mm -hmm. to realize mm -hmm. that that little person and my relationship with them is gone. Yeah. I adore and in some ways, even more so this older person, but that little person is gone. And it's a beauty and a pain that's just about unbearable. I, I, I had huge goosebumps as you were describing that. And we're recording this two days after my two boys left for summer for sleepaway summer camp for the first time ever. Wow. So my husband and I are experiencing a kind of like, you know, forecast of empty nest syndrome for yeah. the next, uh, for the next seven weeks. And I know exactly what you're talking about, you know, oh and you're gosh. so happy for them. And, and I know what you mean, like it, it, the person they've become, you love just as much, if not more. And like their, their company as older people is so incredibly delightful. And, and yet, yeah, my husband always does this thing where he sends photos just like randomly. And they'll just pop up into my text, you know, old photos of the kids from years ago. Uh -huh. And uh, I know exactly the feeling you're talking about. We all do. We all know it. I think we all do. And, and, and your message here is help bring it to light and bring it to light in a different perspective that this thing, yeah, like melancholic, that is not a negative sadness is not a negative thing. And again, I'm the primary student here, Susan, because as you talk about sadness being, you talked about it amongst talking about that movie inside out and some other ways of it being a primary connective point. I get it but I have not done that. Well, I have not done that well as a, as a father, I've not done it well as a husband. Um, I've not done it well as a friend at, until literally as of late, it's been a discussion. I had, I got my, had my guys, we have a Friday morning group and we actually had dinner and wine together and it talked about this kind of line that there's some places we haven't really gone well together in sharing some of the pains and some of the the sorrows. We don't do that as guys, especially. Yeah. And we're taught it, not to. We're taught not to. And I thought about your book watching a sad movie. You mentioned that. And that's a consummate thing. Oh, the you know, chick flick, girls get together and they right, watch a sad right. movie. Guys don't do that. Guys, every once in a while, there'll be a sports movie or a military movie and it brings a little tear, you know, but you don't yes, get together. I know. We're not I hugging know. on the couch and connecting with it. Yeah. Right. Right. And there are the, with the sports movie or the military movie, there are those moments where you can go there. Like, um, which is the movie, I think it's 1917. It's about world war one. I. I don't know if you've seen that one. I don't know. But, oh my God. It's a great movie. And there's this scene in the movie where the, um, I think it's world war one. I. I saw it a while ago, but anyway, the, the, the young men are about to go off into battle and, and, and you know that many of them are about to be killed, you know, like within the hour. And somehow they're, they're all sitting in the middle of this woodland and there's a guy who comes to sing to them that, and he sings that song, I am a poor wayfaring stranger. Oh, yes. You, you might even want to, if you can, like incorporate it into the podcast right now for people to hear, because this particular version of the song, it's so haunting and so gorgeous. I know it from Ed Sheeran. That's, that's who I know the song from. His okay. Version. Okay. Right. I'm yeah. going to send you this version. It's, okay. It's so beautiful. And, uh, and, and, and so it, it is one of those places where men are kind of culturally permitted to yeah. go into that poignant space. Yeah. And, um, and the song is expressing this deep longing that is at the center of all human DNA. And I would say, you know, the other place that we are all allowed to express that longing um, besides sports and the military for men is, um, is in religion. Uh, you know, all religions express this, you know, there's the longing for the garden of Eden and the longing for Zion and the longing to be united with God and, and the longing for Mecca and the longing for the beloved of the soul. There's 
a thousand ways in all the different religions that this gets expressed. And, um, you know, and, and then you have in the Wizard of Oz, like Dorothy is longing for somewhere over the rainbow. So this is the center of what it is to be human. And we need to find ways where it works to express it in our culture. Well, so let's hit on that. I mean, I, I mean, again, I, I, I've grown up in the self-help industry, the personal development industry. Mm -hmm. I've been so aligned with uh, Zig Ziglar and the Ziglar Corporation for so long. Everybody knows him as the optimist and the mm -hmm. positivity. And you know, even his quote, uh, one of his, his primary quotes, you can't, uh, positive thinking won't let you do anything, but it'll let you do everything better than negative thinking. Now, if we're in a workplace or, or I, I, I understand and agree with the concept of that to a point. But then well, as I, we're, to, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I mean, I think it depends on what we mean by negative thinking. I mean, I if by negative thinking, we mean, you know, thoughts like, oh, I can't do this or this right. is too hard or I'll never be able to make it work. Then I'm sure. Worthless, I would, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or I'm worthless or that kind of thing. Sure. I, I, I mean, then I agree. Those kinds of thoughts are not really going to get us anywhere. So that's not really what I'm talking about. Right. Um, but it goes, it still goes to the positive aspect of positive, everything, Pollyanna, everything. And mm -hmm. we hear that and we get the concept, but then I, again, I think we take that as a, a hook, line and sinker aspect. And I, and again, I'm talking for myself, Susan, I did. Yeah. So everything's optimistic. Everything's glass half full, we make lemons, uh, or lemonade out of lemons and, and whatnot. And I did not allow the sorrow. I did not allow that aspect and missed out on connection. I think mm -hmm. I missed out. I have missed out on connect on uh, creativity mm -hmm. uh, that, that I've got within me as opposed to, well, again, my therapist right now, one of the main things are saying, Kevin, when you feel bad, would you just sit in it for a minute? Uh, uh -huh. Don't go run. Don't yeah. go turn good music on. We just sit in it and, and feel it for your own benefit and the benefit of everyone around you instead of just running from it. So I'm on the heels of this when you come along and mm -hmm. showcase the glory, mm -hmm. if I can say, of bittersweet, of the, of the pain, of the sadness, of letting that and, and embracing that. And then all the things that you lay out as far as beautiful things, like the songs from Leonard Cohen, whatnot, mm -hmm. that are a, a beautiful depiction of this pain, a beautiful, that's, that's, that should be hopeful. And that's why I want people, that's what I want people to hear from this show. Yeah. It's, it's, it's extremely hopeful. It's extremely hopeful. And, um, and it's also one of the things that takes us out of ourselves and to this realm of connection. And I mean, one of the greatest ways to feel better is to be able to escape the ego. And, and I think this is one of the great gateways that we have for doing it. But why do you think it is like, what, what, why was your therapist recommending this to you? Like, what did he or she think that you would get access to that you had been depriving yourself of? Oh, goodness. Great question. I think it was just, it was connecting with myself first off, and, and just admitting that there is sadness there. It's not a bad thing. Uh, again, they got me going through Brene Brown's, you know, Atlas of the Heart. <laughs> right, right, it, right. It's not a bad thing that, that I am. I, it was, as my wife has so often said, Kevin, you are human. You are human. It's okay to be, to be human. And, and to some degree, Susan, to quit performing, quit yeah. performing. Yes. Yeah. I think that's really what's at the heart of all of this in modern day, like there's so much performance, there's so yeah. much performance that's going on. So, you know, to be able to talk about these things, it's really just a way of telling the truth of what you, what you actually experience. As okay. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and then, and then, and then you can like relate more honestly with people because you're actually telling them the truth as opposed to only telling them half of the story. Yes. Yes. And, and I, I thought you were going to say something. Else. It, it was also a part of my own self-compassion Yeah. to allow myself to admit that I'm sad and that that is not going to cripple me, which I, I, and I want to, I want to hit that because we are in a place, as you well know, of really bad stats of despair and mm -hmm. depression, you know, and suicide and whatnot. So I'm, concerned that we have more fear than ever at the moment with these 
sad feelings, these melancholic feelings, because which is relevant if you are overtaken by them. Yes. And I feel like you do a good job of balancing that this is a part of a healthy human, but maybe address that right now too, because it feels like we're in a cultural fear of that. And I can see a lot of people running the opposite way, trying to drag their kids out of any melancholic you know, thought or feeling that it's going to just go downhill and they're not going to recover. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really glad that you're asking that question. Cause I would say one of the most common questions that I've been getting is people say people being afraid. They're like, well, I'm afraid that if I tune into this side of myself, I'm going to kind of like fall down a hole of melancholy that will lead to depression and I will yeah. never come out again. Yeah. Um, and what I, and what I would say is I understand why someone would have that fear, but this is not about tuning in only to sorrow. It's about tuning into sorrow as well as to joy, which actually makes you much more whole um, and less depressed at the end of the day. And I'll tell you a story because you mentioned parents. So I'll tell you a story of something that happened with my kids, um, which is we went on this family vacation where we rented a house in the countryside. when My boys were little and this house was situated right next to a field. And in the field, there lived two adorable donkeys named Lucky and Norman. And, and the boys like totally fell in love with Lucky and Norman. And they spent the whole week feeding them carrots and apples and like hanging out by the fence. And it was this big love affair. And, and then we, and then we come to the end of the week and the boys realize that they're going to have to say goodbye and that they'll probably never see these donkeys again. And, and, and the boys are, they're happy kids, but they're crying themselves to sleep at night contemplating having to say goodbye and as parents you know at first they're like beside themselves and, and at first we're saying the things parents usually say like you know someone else will come and take care of lucky and norman or maybe we'll come back who knows you'll see them again and none of that makes any difference and the only thing that actually stops the tears is when we say you know these goodbyes this feeling you're having upon saying goodbye, this is a part of life because things don't last forever. And this feeling that you're feeling, everybody feels it too at different times. You felt it before and you'll feel it again, but the feeling won't last either because things always change. Um, but it's natural, it's normal to feel this way. And that's when they stop crying because it's saying to them, you know, this thing that you're experience, experiencing is real and you're supposed to be feeling it and it's okay because so much of the um so so much of the 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 emotional suffering we have comes not from the pain itself but but from our feeling that the pain is wrong and that we're not supposed to be having it and once you accept that oh this is actually part of life just like anything else that resistance goes away and so you're only dealing with the pain itself and not with the whole secondary mechanism of resistance. Um, and so far from descending into depression, it's, it's actually like really comforting to know that, oh, that this pain that I see on the horizon as goodbye is approaching, that's normal and everybody feels it. Your story of the donkeys and your sons, one of the biggest shifts in my parenting, Susan. So I do, I have got older. My, so my oldest kid is 27 and my youngest is 10. Wow. That's a huge yeah. gap. It's, it's, it's a huge that's amazing. Gap. Yeah. It's a, there's, there's a story there, but, um, I the kid comes in from outside uh, with a busted knee or toe or whatever blood, you know, or whatnot. And I, in all care am scoop them down, get them in. Oh my gosh, let's wash it up. Let me get a bandaid on that. Let me put some, uh, anti antiseptic or whatever, you know, to help the pain. You need ibuprofen, whatever. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. That's who I was. Mm -hmm. It seemed perfectly logical to me. Sure. My wife reads a book on attachment and they do a study showcasing the beneficial attachment that happens not by doing that, by fixing the owie, 
but by just embracing the kid and holding them mm-hmm. saying, I'm so sorry. It, it was one of the most immediate changes we were, cause I could do that that day, you know, with the next time the kid comes, okay, let's try it. Didn't address it. Blood's going down the knee, whatever, and mm-hmm. just hold them. I'm so mm-hmm. sorry. And the difference in their response. And we've, we've saved hundreds of dollars in band-aids because half the time, <laughs> half the time they just, oh, yeah, tears stop. And then they run off and go play again. Yeah. Yeah. And they just, and it just, it blew my mind as far as attachment and humanity and emotions and how we deal that with that, just as you're talking about, as opposed to trying to minimize it, I guess, which is just, that's just what I understood. It's what I do with myself. And again, you know, I got my own mm-hmm. therapist saying, don't do that, Kevin, don't minimize it. And to your story of your sons showcases that to me, if we can come in, well, it's you're back to connecting again. Yeah. And it's not to say that you're wallowing. Like you're, you're not saying yeah, that okay, for the right. next week, you're going to be saying to your kid, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that you scraped right. your knee. You're not going to do it for a week. You're going to do it for that moment in time for, you're going to do it as the moment requires it. That's what you're going to do. No, no more and no less. Um, which I think is important to say, because there is such a, a fear about wallowing in, in negative emotions. Yeah. You say it was actually in the intro to your book. You said the place that you suffer in other words, is the same place you care profoundly that Mm -hmm. you care enough to act. And that brought me again, it was just such a highlight of this idea, especially in the business world, you know, this, that the the idea of go and work at your passions, find your passions. And we use that Mm -hmm. word passions. I had two guys, uh, John O'Leary and, and the other guy's name, I'm not pulling Mm -hmm. up at the moment in the span of about 30 days, I, I had them both on my show, uh, these two guys and in talking about this kind of, this kind of a topic, they said that what resonated with them more so than passions was what's that thing that breaks your heart. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got it delivered to me twice and it resonated Mm -hmm. more Susan, because I, I I've, I've always, I've said in in years past without different vernacular that I was aware of, I said, man, a lot of the things that I go after are things that just burden me. That was the word that I used. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I like there breaks your heart, but you brought in that the, the thing, the place you suffer, that place where you care profoundly is the place that you care enough to act. You could, again, extrapolate to it, that to a passion, but I feel like it opens the door maybe in a more authentic way, more broadly than just the, the passion, the positive. Yeah. And I guess what, you know, because I'm so focused on kind of like weaving together joy and sorrow, I mean, okay. my, my reaction to what you just said is, I think it's both, honestly. Okay. Like, I think it's the place that breaks your heart and it's the passion. Um, so I don't know, like I'm thinking if you're the person, let's say your your child was killed on a highway and so you start the organization Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Right. Um, clearly that came from the place that broke this parent's heart for sure. I'm also guessing, and I'm I'm saying this actually without knowledge of this particular situation, but I'm guessing that this person who did this had has some kind of passion for organ or organizational life or creating an organization or something, because otherwise you you might direct that heartbroken impulse in a different direction. So I think it's it's a question of kind of marrying those two things. Well, which is what you do overall. I mean, the, again, I'm thinking with bittersweet, it's bitter and sweet. I mean, I don't, yeah, I, I don't yeah. think we even do justice to the word. It's bitter and sweet that, and what you elevated to me in the book with your stories, because you have so many incredible, yes, yeah, shameless plug for the book, folks. I mean, the, the stories that you tell drive home the concept so well, because it is a continual I like the word tension, mm-hmm. you know, bitter and sweet between the beauty and, and the pain. That's the one that I resonated most with. And it, it, in years past, again, without having some of this vernacular, it was the, why it's so beautiful. It's kind of, it, it's an ache and you use the word yes. longing. Um, yeah. it, it is, it's a longing. It's like, it's just, it's almost, it's too, it's really too much to take in. And 
I, I think about that so acutely when we see something these days. So I live out here, I'm looking out my window. I live, I live out in the national forest in the Rocky mountains and, oh, and wow, there's nice. so much, so much beauty. It's my daily visual vitamins. And there's so often the idea to take a picture of it, to share. And it never even room. I, at this point, half the time, I just don't, I, I just don't, it's just so stupid. You can't capture it. It's, uh-huh, uh-huh. I can't even capture it with my own eyes. As I'm seeing the sun, it's on my face, the snow's coming down, whatever it is. And the beauty, I can't even, I can't even pull it all in it. It is. It's such, it's so beautiful. It's painful. And I think what you're trying to capture when you have that impulse to share it, yeah, it's not, I don't know that it's the beauty per se that you're trying to share. I think okay. it's the emotion that it stirs up in you. Okay. Think, keep, keep giving me therapy. Yeah. Well, I, it's, there's just, there's something about um, entering into that kind of state of beauty where it's like beyond, beyond everyday life Yeah. that hits at that place where the longing and the thing that you long for are, are kind of coming together. Um, it's the same thing. Like when you talk about music or, you know, like that moment that you might have at the concert where everybody is together experiencing um, a a, a certain song or something, it's, it's the emotion that the song has conjured up that we're all feeling together. That's what we're really in it for. Um, and, and like what, what all these religions teach us about this is that the state of longing is actually one of the greatest states that we can enter because the it's the state of longing itself that delivers us closer to belonging. It, it delivers us closer mm. to that for which we long. Yeah. And that for which we long is basically, you know, love and divinity, if you're religiously inclined or, or love or, you know, truth or beauty or goodness, like the, the highest states of humanity or what, what we feel um, when we get into that state of longing. And that's why, you know, you, you see like an incredible athletic feat, you know, you're watching Messi on the soccer field or you're watching Simone Biles, like turning her unbelievable somersaults and, and you kind of like gasp. And what are you gasping at? It's, it's like you're see these athletes for a moment are delivering us to the state of this perfect and beautiful world that we feel like we long for and that we feel like we belong to, but yeah. don't quite get to live in. That's, that's the fundamental human state and it's our best selves. It does make me think of the things that do touch us like that, that are often maybe the things that we can relate to Yeah, you know, watching mm-hmm. sports, which I actually don't do. That's a, odd thing, but I don't do, I I know I don't do it that often, but I generally try to tune into the Olympics and it just brings me to tears because I, I, I understand that I understand giving your all having spent so long, uh, doing the dirty work back here that nobody saw and to come forward and to put it all out watching this last Olympics, man, I'm not going to pull her name up either. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing well with names today, but the, the girl in the winter Olympics, cross-country skiing, the American, who just after every finish, she just splayed out totally spent. And it just, <laughs> I, it just, I wanted to get her on the show and I've forgotten about it till now. And it just, it just <laughs> wrecked me because I, so it's such a beautiful yeah. scene to me that I, I, I can relate to. And you mentioned beyond everyday life. And we see that thing, feel that thing, hear that thing, uh, experience that thing. And, you know, you can use the word transcendence, which I, I think a lot of the religious sector doesn't like as much or certain religions don't like but I would say spiritual, it's something beyond self. It's something greater than just the little, little story of of that, that I'm in generally in the moment. Yeah, exactly. And you see it in so many different ways. So, I mean, my, my husband and and my boys are all really sports obsessed. And if you met my husband, like he wouldn't strike you as a bittersweet type. He's much more of like an athletic type. And we were like watching, Stanley cup last night. Cause he used to be a hockey right. player and, um, you know, and he was rooting for Colorado and they won. And it's like it just be this moment, you know, where they come out onto the ice and like the wives come out and everybody's crying with joy. It's what is that? What is that? It, it's, it's a moment that is beyond everyday life. It's, yeah. it's a kind of moment of love that's getting enacted, um, in a socially acceptable context. That's basically what's happened. 
happening. Yeah, it makes me think of excellence or brilliance or beauty. And, you know, the, the so many scenes that just evoke a, a tear that yeah. evoke that, that evoke that feeling are generally the most beautiful, the, the wedding. Why is it that that touches us so much that, that symbolism of, of commitment and joining together. And it's just, and everybody's in tears, especially mm -hmm. the father, Yeah, uh, you know, I, what, what is that about that, that, yeah, that in your, I come back to connectedness. It brings us all, it almost kind of levels the playing field. Doesn't it, Susan? You say, you say more about it, what you mean. It, just, just when we, no matter where you are, no matter what, I just did a show on, you know, racial equality and uh, marginalization and stereotypes and kind of all that. And yet we can have some people of different socioeconomic levels, genders, you know, race, yada, yada. And when we experience that a moment as we we're talking about, mm -hmm. and it brings everybody to tears, we're all in the same playing yeah. field. Yeah. Connectedness and again, it's connectedness. And I, I, I believe it's connectedness around, um, a kind of moment in which you're glimpsing the Garden of Eden. I, I think that's really what's happening. And I'm, I'm using the reference to Eden, like metaphorically, it's like you go to a wedding and that, you know, there's a moment in which everybody together is believing in the state of a possibility of like a pure and unconditional love that everybody right. longs for. So it's like this glimpse of, of the perfect world we all long for. Um, I mean, there's like the epigraph that I use for the book. Um, well, I have two, but one of them comes from Gregory the Great, like in the year 540. So many centuries ago, and he's talking about the holy pain that people experience when they're faced with that, which is most beautiful. Mm. Um, and this is a, a professor of religion talking about this. And he says, the bittersweet experience stems from human homelessness in an imperfect world, but at the same time, a desire for perfection. And so when you're faced with beauty, he's saying the inner spiritual void becomes painfully real because mm. you see that moment of beauty, you know, at the wedding and you're like, oh my gosh, that there it is. There's Eden. And we're all together in our longing for it. I think a foundational message that I that resonates most with me, Susan, with, with your book and your message from bittersweet is that if I am not allowing the emotions and not mm -hmm. allowing the pain, the sadness, I'm also not allowing the fullness of the beauty. And exactly. That's what burdens me. That's, that's right. What, okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The, not allowing the fullness of, of the beauty and of the creative impulse and of our ability to, to connect in the first place. But it's again, mirror, not mirrored held, as you said, with the, it's not just going down into the depths of despair. It's holding them both together. Uh, in something you said mm -hmm. earlier, Susan reminded me of a, and, and I was trying to think, is that just painting a positive light on it? But I don't think it is. And it was a depiction that I saw might've been in a movie, might've been something I read, nothing new. Others may have heard about it, but it just resonated with me of, uh, it was a death. Uh, somebody died. It was a, I think it was a child. It was like, it was a parent lamenting a child that was, uh, 10, 12, 13, something like that. And they died and the parent just couldn't. Oh, I remember the, I remember the movie, uh, collateral beauty. Oh, uh, never saw Will that Smith. one. Okay. I, it's just tremendous as far as talking about emotions and dealing with trauma mm -hmm. and the guy could not get past the death of his child. And what was offered to him was the perspective of looking and going, could you look at it differently and say, I am so grateful that I got to experience that child at all mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. 10 years, eight years, 12 years, whatever it was, could mm -hmm. I be? And I thought, okay, I could see that that somebody might feel like that's putting a Pollyanna spin, but I thought, no, it, it, the, the reason that I would feel such a loss is because of my gratitude mm. for my child, which again, I've got a lot. And so I, I think about this, it may sound morbid, but I think the chances of me losing a child are much higher than the norm. 
How am I going to respond? Yeah. How am I going to respond? Because right now I'm preparing myself to respond poorly, to be overtaken by it, Mm -hmm. to end up in divorce, suicide, despair, whatever, or I'm preparing myself to deal with it well, as well as possible. And can I look at that now and go, man, the loss I'm going to feel is in relation to the joy that I have had in experiencing this person. Mm -hmm. And can I, Mm -hmm. if that moment came, can I can I rest more in that than the loss or equally? Yeah, would that be, would yeah. that be fair? Yeah. yeah, that's a really good question. And as, as, as you know, I, I, in the book explored the question of um, how people might respond to the loss of a child. Cause I, I, it's one of the greatest and most profound losses that I could possibly imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't care to, I don't hope to, yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah it is a significant way of looking at the the beauty and the pain that you mm-hmm. have, have brought uh, to this. I, as you, as this book has, has come out, I just read recently, I think it was today uh, or, or yesterday that writing a book is like telling a joke and you got to wait two years to see if people got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm writing, I'm in, I'm at, right at the tail end of, of my first book deal, uh, Susan, but as this book has come out, um, how, how has the response been? Has there been anything surprising that you have heard in response to the book that you may not have expected? I don't know. It's just been kind of amazing because so many people, I feel like they're reacting kind of the way you've expressed, you know, so many people saying, oh my gosh, I've been feeling these things all my life and never knew how to express them or never felt like I could express them. Um, and, and it's just an amazing thing. Like what one person told me, she's been documenting these kinds of experiences all her life and she hmm. has called them quote humanity pangs. So wow. that, yeah. Yeah. And, and then another guy who's a, a filmmaker in LA wrote to tell me that he he also his whole life has had this experience of listening to sad music and having the same kind of experience that we've talked about of you know this sense of uplift and transcendence when you hear it and uh, and he has always privately called it to himself quote that holy feeling holy like wow. h-o-l-y um and that's been an amazing thing you know all these people saying that they now feel a kind of permission to access this thing that they've always known is their deepest state, but could yeah. never put into words or never felt like it was okay to. Um, and I guess what was surprising was when, when I wrote this book, I thought of it as being quite different from my first book, Quiet, which was about the power of introverts in an extroverted world. But the letters that I'm getting kind of echo the, the letters that I got from quiet in that with both books, it's people telling me, I now feel permission. To I, was, who I, am. I just wrote the word permission down. That's what yeah. I was going to come back with. Yeah. yeah, That's Absolutely. the word. I, I, I get that word over and over and over again. Wow. Permission to be myself, permission to feel what I feel, experience what I experience um, and to understand, you know, the, the possession of a superpower that they hadn't been aware it was like sitting right in front of them all this time. That's what I'm taking from this, Susan. That's a, a primary thing. I, it's, it's, um, I'm eager to go partake of some things, mm-hmm. some beautiful moments and give more consideration to the pain and the ache and the longing mm-hmm. so that I experience them, uh, more. It was, um, I had Rick Hansen on the show a couple of years ago. His book, first book was a uh, heart or the one I knew was hardwiring happiness. Um, and he talks about in there that the way to most engage or digest happiness is to sit in it. Don't just notice it and take a picture of it and mm-hmm. mention it, but sit in it and let it resonate and, and feel it. And you have me feeling the same way when I see that beauty when I hear that aura it's sit in it sit in it and feel both sides feel the ache and have permission to yeah it's funny you say that because people ask me sometimes well what you know what can I do and how can I kind of 
access this date. And the first thing I say actually is to begin your day by proactively experiencing beauty. Yeah. Um, because beauty itself like tells the truth of the fullness of our emotions. So if you're like totally opened up and attuned to beauty, you're also going to be totally opened up and attuned to these various aspects of our like yeah. emotional lives, you know, that yeah, the, the ache as well as the cheeriness. Uh, I, I love tension. I find myself talking about that more and more people talk about balance and I like the tension. And this is a, a beautiful, bittersweet, uh, tension. Thank you, Susan, for the work that you've done to bring this forward, for the permission that you're helping us all take for ourselves. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Kevin, so much for having me. It was really a joy to talk to you. <laughs>